Welcome to the Tech and Real Estate channel, where we bridge the gap between real estate and technology. Today, we're discussing the key factors to consider when investing in real estate with Michael Zuber. I am your host, Ariel Herrera, and data scientist. Our guest, Michael, is the creator of One Rental at a Time, and he shares his insights and experiences in real estate investing. He discusses his journey from losing money in the stock market to finding success in real estate. Michael emphasizes the importance of understanding the market and using the advantages of personal connections, which sometimes could be more so advantageous than using data. He also provides valuable advice on analyzing the real estate market, including factors such as unemployment, new mortgage demand, and active inventory. Viewers will gain a valuable knowledge and strategies to make informed investment decisions after watching this episode. Hey, Michael, welcome to the channel. Thank you for the opportunity. This should be a lot of fun. I love I love talking about real estate technology, all that stuff. So uh, let's get into it. Yeah, super excited to have you here. I've been following One Rental at a Time for several years now. And your experience that you shared, not only as an investor, but also as someone who has a lot of in-depth knowledge of economics, has been really interesting to follow. But before we dive into that, we'd love to hear a little bit more about your background and why did you start investing in real estate? Yeah. So the short answer is I started investing in real estate because I lost a lot of money in the stock market. Right? I, uh, I, went, I went to school. I was raised to go to school, get a good job, you know, climb the corporate ladder. That was, you know, work 40 hours for 40 years. And I was well on my way. Uh, by the time I was 30 years old, I'd saved about seven grand from the day job. I turned that into 200 grand in the stock market. Thought I was a genius. I got cocky and unfortunately then lost 80% of that. And I felt like a complete failure uh, as a husband and father. And that's when I stumbled across Rich Dad, Poor Dad. It did start me on a new journey. It did enlighten me to the possibilities of, of rentals and landlording, which is really shocking. I'm a 31, I'm 30 at the time. You know, I have an MBA, an economics degree, finance, right? I'm very comfortable with numbers in tech. And this <laughs> Rich Dad, Poor Dad goes, hey, stupid, look over there. I'm like, uh, so, uh, yeah, so th that's what brought me to real estate was a failure of colossal proportions of losing money in the stock market. Maybe, maybe some people have a similar experience in crypto. Maybe you made a lot and didn't sell and you lost a lot. That, that was me in the dot-com era. I was, I was that guy. Awesome. So then you found your way, decided to go into real estate investing. And did you decide to go to invest in the local market or somewhere far away? Well, everything I read, because Rich Dad Poor Dad is is a mindset book. It's not how to, right? There's not one how to in that book. And so every other book I read uh, told me to invest in my backyard, but none of those authors lived in the Silicon Valley. But I didn't know any better, so I wasted, I wasted a year, beating my head against the wall trying to find cash flow in the Bay Area. Wow. I was not going to be an appreciation investor. I only wanted cash flow. And it doesn't work. After a year, again, my wife gets full credit for this. She said, hey, stupid, we got to try something different. Uh, we found Fresno, California, two and a half hours away, brand new market, didn't know anybody, had to build a team, had a lot of mistakes. and uh, But ultimately, live where you want, invest where the numbers make sense. So mm -hmm. uh, that's what we did. Awesome. And I think a lot of people at least I come from my channel, they look to also invest maybe a little bit outside of their current area. Maybe they live in a high expensive market like New York City as well. And the biggest question is, well, what factors should I be looking at? Should I try to look at everything on the list, migration trends, um, unemployment data, new Whole Foods that are coming up? How do you try to guide someone who's maybe getting started as to like what factors actually do matter when analyzing a market? You know, I love this conversation. It is my belief that most people are asking the wrong questions, right? If you're trying to pick the best market because of migration trends or population or license plate changes or U-Haul trucks or whatever, the plethora of data, you're, in my opinion, doing it the wrong way. What you need to be asking yourself is, where might I have an unfair advantage? All right, what the heck does that mean? Where do you have family? Where do you have friends? Where do you have relationships? 
where you can get boots on the ground, trusted boots on the ground that will tell you bad news. One of the things, if you go to a brand new market and you know you don't know anyone, is the only people that are going to tell you stuff are people you're paying, the property manager, the real estate agent, the contractor, and some will boldface lie. All of them will tell you the most rosy picture of the current situation. I like having a you know a college roommate drive by, an aunt drive by, every once in a while. And then the last thing is I would tell you is you got to find a market you're comfortable with. For example, uh, one of the people I speak with every week on my channel, his name's Millennial Mike. Uh, he tried to invest in Seattle. In fact, did a house hack, very successful, but couldn't do another one. He ended up going to Gary, Indiana. Gary, Indiana, if you look up just the numbers, right through a spreadsheet, would be on nobody's top 10 list. It might not be on the top 1,000 list. But why did it work for Mike? He found another investor, mentor, that was having success there. So what I would tell you to do is find a market you're comfortable with, then spend your time networking. There's a guy I speak with, the, uh, a financial firefighter, or fire, I guess it is, his handle. He lives in Honolulu and invests in Pittsburgh. Wow. Right. <laughs> so again, you got to find a market where you have an unfair advantage. And that typically to me is boots on the ground that you trust and an investor or several investors that you know are having success there. In every market across the country, there is someone and likely several someone's having success. So I believe if you're like a data scientist, a computer programmer, whatnot, and you're comfortable geeking out on data, you're not making any progress. You should start networking in Facebook groups or bigger pocket forums or uh, RA or meetups online. That's where the, real estate's a people business. And I say this as a geek, Excel spreadsheet wizard who could do all these things. I wasted five years thinking the answer is in my computer. The answer is in your network and people. Get out of your comfort zone and go network. That's what I tell someone. Yeah, 100% agree. It's like data is useful to help them make informed decisions. But end of day, you need to have some type of presence um, in person. Like, for example, when I started investing in New Jersey, everything pointed towards probably Newark and Trenton, which are not known to be the best areas and areas that I probably wouldn't feel comfortable walking around after 5 p.m. Okay. So, um, yeah, I think it is good to have boots on the ground in that sense as well. Yeah, let me be very clear. If you're geeking out on spreadsheets only and you don't get boots on the ground, you're going to go to a cheap market and lose your butt. You're going to lose. Yeah, you can go broke buying cheap. So what do you think of, I've heard this recently, scouring some uh, social pages like Reddit's to mm -hmm. understand like different sentiments if people feel like positive for a certain area, more negative. What are your thoughts of using that type of information? I generally believe social media, including Reddit, skews negative. I believe I believe the world on social media is probably 60% negative, 40% flat or positive. But it's only because negative people are the loudest. Mm -hmm. I think the the folks that are optimistic and they're doing the work and they're making gains, they're not on social media. They're out doing deals. Right. It's the, you know, it's the person in his mom's basement who's, you know, mad at the world and raging against the machine, smoking weed and playing video games that's on Reddit and, you know, Twitter and, you know, all these other things. So I don't, uh, I don't like leaning on social media because I think it's poison if you don't audit your network. And then that includes right. auditing social media. Yeah. It's not always you could take it for a grain of salt and say, okay, someone said one thing about maybe Tampa, Florida, and now the whole city is bad, right? There's so many yeah, different pockets on. and areas. And I guess- So again, let's let's go, let's poke at that a little bit. So you go to Reddit, some subreddit or whatever, and you find you know somebody talking bad about Tampa. I promise you, there are hundreds of investors killing it in Tampa. Yep. And they are none of, and zero of them are on Reddit. That's a signal. Yeah. That's not where they're sitting. <laughs> no. Why would they go there? They don't want to deal with these numbskulls. I mean, I, I put myself out there, right? And uh, 
all these idiots just rage against the machine. Like, you know, I'm like, okay, you just keep being broke. It's okay. Just stay in your mom's <laughs> basement. It's all right. So say if we have someone that's able to bypass kind of looking at just these data points, has someone boots on the ground, they know maybe they want to invest in, um, let's say Lakeland, Florida, since I know you mentioned that recently and it's close to me. Sure. Um, yeah, yeah. If they are looking to invest in that area and it's not the widest city, but it is pretty substantial. So like, how would someone know what pockets within there to invest in and have their family member maybe go drive by? So I actually believe learning the skill of real estate investing is step one. Area location is step two. What do I mean by that? I believe unless you know what you're doing, you're gambling. That includes Lakeland. That includes Miami. That includes any market across the country, right? Just because you have money doesn't give you permission to jump the line. I work in tech. Lots of people get bonuses and RSUs and all of these things, and they have impressive you know, stock balances. But that does not give you permission to skip the line. What do I mean by that? I believe everybody needs to create a buy box. So let's just, I don't know Lakeland at all. It was just reported as one of the top markets. But what, what I would tell a new investor who wants to go to Lakeland is, okay, great. Lakeland is too big. You can't learn Lakeland. You can't even learn Lakeland single family homes. What you need to do is you need to create what I call a buy box. And I have tons of videos on this, but simply said, it is a very tight set of criteria that produces between 20 and 40 active listings. And then you need to set it and forget it. And you need to look at that every day for 90 days. What will eventually happen is you will learn what an average deal looks like in Lakeland in this very, very tight buy box. Then, and only then, can you start writing great offers. So back to your question of, hey, how do I, you know, how do I know where to look? You got to learn the skill first. Then you could go and start looking at different areas in Lakeland. Again, if you don't, if you, your order is out of whack, you're gambling. And I don't like to gamble. Right. So to really start, yeah, analyze, have a tight window of what your criteria is, analyze it for a period of time. And what are some factors that could help you understand if it's becoming a buyer's or seller's market for that given buy box if you're analyzing it for three months? If you're looking at it every day, it's, you're, it's going to scream to you. How fast are they staying on? Are there price drops? Are they coming off and going back on? What's the days on market? Is it different or you know, is my little box different than the rest of Lakeland that's different than the rest of Florida? The data will jump off the page. That's why you've got to be consistent. That's why you have to do it every day. Um, it's going to feel monotonous. It's supposed to. But that's how you learn. Like, Have you played sports or learned a second language or played instruments? Have you done any of those? Yeah, played sports. Like which one? Baseball. So Baseball. You, get, you get handed a bat. First time you take that swing, it's like, this doesn't feel good. <laughs> yeah. You get in the batting cage, you take some reps, you keep learning it. Then you learn, oh, by the way, if I angle or I keep my stance tighter, I can hit it to right field instead of left field, right? You can learn how to use the bat as a tool. You don't, you don't just, very few people are just naturally gifted and nobody is naturally gifted at real estate. Do the freaking work. Just do the work and learn the skill. It takes practice and discipline. Yeah. And if you look naturally gifted, that might also signal that you're just lucky. Yeah, you're. <laughs> oh, I've seen plenty naturally gifted people. I would rather be not gifted in work than mm -hmm. naturally gifted because I'll pass you. I will eventually. You're lazy. You don't take the gift for granted. You don't work hard. Uh, I will. I will eventually pass you for sure. Great. So we kind of dived a little bit into analyzing particular, like not city, but I guess what your buy box would look like and how you analyze properties one at a time, but taking a little bit more high level of trying to understand how just the general real estate market is changing. Um, there's a lot of different factors to look at and it could help both a newbie, but also someone who's experienced who may want to shift their strategy a bit. So going to some of these, how does unemployment and jobs um, help to signal where the economy is going? Yeah, so I think when you step back in at a macro level, these are these are great conversations. I think there's really two macro things and then three real estate things anybody could track and get a 
get a pulse of what's going on. So we do unemployment first. Uh, that's great. Unemployment is one of those factors that when it spikes uh, quickly, right, we're talking in a couple of weeks, not a slow grind over months, can dent consumer psyche. Because again, like there's this old definition of the difference between a recession and a depression. A recession is when your neighbor gets laid off. A depression is when you get laid off. Mm -hmm. So if we are starting to see unemployment rise and your friend or your friend's friend is starting to get unemployment notice, that can cause you to pull back, right? That can cause you to save. And as a consumer economy, which is, you know, 68, 70% of the economy, getting a consumer that's retrenching can cause a recession all by itself, right? So that's how unemployment could do it. Um, you know, next, if we're talking real estate, I think there are three variables you should track today. And this could change over time, but if, you know, in 2024, there are three things that I'm tracking weekly to see what's going on. One, uh, new listings. Why is that important? Well, I believe the Fed has broken the housing market and has essentially taken the move up buyer, which is the largest part of the market because they're both a buyer and a seller, yeah. right? There are two transactions and put them on the shelf. I believe the move up buyers on the shelf for years. How, how are we going to know that breaks? You're going to see new listings rise. So I'm tracking new listings every week. And we Altos research the housing wire. They put out this stuff every Friday, I believe. So I'm trying to say, okay, great. What's going on? Is it spiking? And right now the answer is no. Next, I'm looking at more uh, mortgage demand. I think Mortgage Bankers puts this out every Wednesday or Thursday. I want to know what's the demand for purchases and refinances. And again, we get the data weekly. Why is that important? I think there's a general backup of demand because when rates went to 8%, buyers revolted. They said, screw this. I'm not buying. I'm out. But you know what? Rates aren't 8%. They're now six and a half or six and three quarters. So I'm watching mortgage demand. Because again, if you get more purchase apps, it doesn't mean a transaction's coming. It's just the earliest indicator that demand is increasing. Right. And then finally, active inventory. And active inventory is going to tell me is demand exceeding supply. If active inventory decreases week on week, we got a problem, right? Demand is outpacing supply. So those are the things. And, and thankfully, thanks to Mortgage Bankers Association, Altos Research, Housing Wire, we get the data every week. And I look at it every week. So I think that's something anybody could look at. Every week and for free. This information is- And for free. Yes. Be behind paywalls. <laughs> Correct. Yes. Mike Simonson, Logan uh, Matsushami, uh, and the Mortgage Bankers. Yeah, they're they're great resources. Follow them on Twitter. It's it's right there every, every Friday, I believe. Great. Yeah, I love the call out that you made to each of these, as well as this diving into new listings a bit of how- uh, the way you're bucketing it are there's different types of buyers and people who would sell a property as well. You're not just saying buyers and sellers. And I think that distinction is important because you get to really understand who that possible consumer or um, individual is to understand what their next steps would be. And yeah. what are like the other buckets that you look at for that? Well, for the macro level, that's it. But if we're going to break down the, the investor market, I think it is the other thing that I look at and I just keep beating on is you need to figure out your market. In this case, let's say Lakeland. I have no idea what it is, but let's say Lakeland's median home price is 400 grand. What I would be doing is bifurcating the market, right? If I was really a data geek, I would say 400 and above is luxury, 400 and below is first time home buyer. Why is that important? It is my belief that the first time home buyers, FHA buyers, VA buyers have been largely ignored for several years when rates were low. I believe that market as millennials age into prime buying years will be very active. Unfortunately, if my thesis is correct, the inventory won't be there because the move up buyer is not there. And a move up buyer sells the cheap home to buy an expensive home. So you will have markets that have growing inventory, but it's the wrong inventory. We have several markets where days on market is up, but it's only because the luxury market is dead. Mm -hmm. 
if you break it down to below and above the median, the below the market, like there are some markets where the below the median has like nine days of inventory. But if you look at the macro, it's got 48. That's just because there's some, you know, some listings with 600 days on market that are pulling them up. So uh, I would tell people to go, if they want to go one level deeper, figure out the median home price for your market and then track above and below. Cause I think you'd be shocked at how different the data is. Yeah, I think that's critical. And I also went to a recent um, sub two meeting. I'm not, not doing sub two, but I wanted to just kind of network yeah. with others in the area. And they Great made idea. a critical distinction that price uh, homes below FHA limits were actually still selling really fast, but those above exactly. have just been sitting on the market. Luxury market. Again, people don't understand this. The people that are all doomers on real estate, a lot of their stats are being skewed by luxury homes, which... Okay, fine. If you want to be distracted, go ahead and be distracted. Exactly. Yeah. And I I think it's so interesting, real estate, and how it's hyper-localized for a lot of these different segments. And it really shows that you can make yourself an investor, not just in the top 50 markets, but in even well, local small areas too. There are, there are a million millionaire real estate and multimillionaire real estate investors in every city of every town across the country. It's been Real estate's been the... Mo there are more millionaires because of real estate than anything else. You know, go get your piece. Inflation's a feature, not a bug. I wish more people understood that. Um, Thirty-year mortgage in residential is a gift. It's a one-way bet. Rates go up, you do nothing. Rates go down, you refi. Uh, we we have a lot of advantages in in real estate in the United States because of the debt structure and uh, all of that. So um, do the work, folks. Do the work. Yeah. So. Shifting over, uh, lastly, to these advantages that people have, um, being able to buy the first property, for example, as an, maybe they're living in it or they're investing in it. What would you suggest for someone who is getting started? They're excited. They're someone who maybe is um, a techie. They can kind of take their job anywhere they'd like. They want to get a house. Should they live in it first? Or they just try to do an investment property. What are your thoughts? Live where you want, invest where the numbers make sense. So again, if you're in an environment where you you want to buy a home and all of that, then by all means, you know, buy that home, turn it into a rental in two or three years is a wonderful strategy. Best interest rate, lowest down, easiest way to get started. Go for it. If you really want to get nutty, you know, go buy a fourplex, live in one of those and have three of your tenants, you know, pay for it. Because getting wealthy is a remarkably simple process. You have to create disposable income, discretionary income, which is money left over after all living expenses. And if you could take your largest non-tax, right? Income tax is our biggest expense, housing and make it zero, you're going to be stacking paper week after week after week. So if you can, if you're in that part of life where you want to live in a fourplex, go do that. You can also get 203K loans on fixer-uppers, I mean, there are so many programs to get you on the real estate ladder for homeowners. Um, just figure out what's right for you and your family and your situation and do the work. Yeah, I believe FHA, didn't they increase the limits or something along the lines for multifamily? They did. They actually, I think what you're referring to that hit the press is uh, for fourplexes, there used to be this uh, sustainability test. They've now remove that and you can get into a fourplex with 5% down. So wow, huge. It used to be 20. <laughs> yeah. It used to be 20. Well, awesome. Thank you so much for your time, Michael. And if someone wants to follow you as well as um, maybe look into some of the courses that you have around buy box and how to get started, how would they do so? Yeah. The one, one thing I've done right is everything I do is one rental at a time, website, YouTube channel, book, of course. Um, yeah. I, I should be easy to find. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much.